evaluating. <laughs> we are being evaluated um, throughout our lives. The evaluation that we want to l really look at is the evaluation of Jesus Christ. We want to see what he would say about us. We want him to examine us. So this is a series on evaluations. And, and today we're going to ask the question, what will you celebrate when you finish it all, when you're done with all of your evaluations, are you going to, do, do you wear a hood or anything like that, Paul? Um, actually, I'm not attending it. It's you're not even attending your graduation? So, so he's not going to celebrate. Okay, so, don't, so whatever you do, no gifts, no, no. Well, <laughs> oh, you are going to celebrate. <laughs> Okay, so for those of you who are hearing this on the video, Paul is uh, graduating June 24th for, as a nurse practitioner, and he has chosen to celebrate quietly with his family rather than in the big graduation. There will be some people in the big graduation, they'll have hoods on, funny hats, all those kinds of things. They may throw those hats and do all kinds of other things celebrating um, their graduation. My question to you is when you get to heaven, when you're standing in front of Jesus, what are you going to celebrate? When you're right there face to face with him, if you know Jesus Christ, and, I, and obviously, if you've never committed your life to Jesus Christ, if you're at a time where you really do believe and truly are an atheist, and you say, oh, okay, I'm just checking this out, but I really don't believe in God. Uh, when, when you get to the end of your time, who or what are you going to face? According to the Bible, it says we will all stand in front of Jesus. Whether we believe in him or not, we'll all stand in front of him. In fact, it, the, the dangerous thing is it's described as the judgment seat of God. We'll all stand there. We'll all have a moment. And, then, and if we've said, I didn't believe in God, and yet we stand in front of God, what will you celebrate? If you don't believe in God, what will you celebrate? because it won't be a celebration. First Thessalonians, we're going through this, uh, for this letter, and, and I think First Thessalonians is really good because it helps us look at the second coming of Christ. Uh, and there's going to be some different pieces that we're going to see as we go through this. In First Thessalonians, we're now at chapter 2, verse 17. Paul says, But brothers and sisters, when we were orphaned by being separated from you for a short time, in person, not in thought, out of our intense longing, we made every effort to see you. For we wanted to come to you. Certainly I, Paul, did again and again. But Satan blocked our way. For what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. In the uh, ESV, it says, but since we were torn away from you just for a short time, in person, not in heart, we endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face because we were torn away from you, because we were taken away from you like the little baby who was taken out of the hospital uh, away from her mom. Like the one that Solomon had to deal with who came and said, her baby died, I took, and this one's my baby. Now she's trying to claim it. And why? She had taken the, the baby in the middle of the night because her baby had died. The, torn away. And we wanted to see you face to face. Have you ever felt the pain of separation? The pain of separation. Think about a parent when their child's been kidnapped. And the Oh, the fear and agony and, and all the horror that they're going through in their thoughts and trying to deal with that, the pain of separation. The circumstances can separate us, can't they? When, um, when our son Tim was born, um, he, we went in, we're not knowing anything, he's first child, you know, we go to the hospital and we get to the hospital and they're doing some fetal monitoring and the heart rate's going down to almost zero and stuff like that. And we're like, okay, well, I guess maybe it's just the monitor, they were kind of saying that. Soon, literally, the second that Tim was born, they grabbed him and took him away. And... Uh, I'm, I'm standing there at Debbie's head, and Debbie's laying there on this table, and everyone's over there. We have no idea what's going on. We just know that Tim's been taken, 
In fact, we don't even know he's a Tim yet because at that point in time, we didn't know boys or girls what we were coming. It was a surprise to us. By the way, Debbie did say, and you need to tease her about this one, if it was going to be a boy, she was going to send him back. I don't know how she was going to do it, but... (laughs) But that was her plan. She wanted girls. <laughs> she didn't want a boy. And so she was planning on sending, <laughs> sending a boy back. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe that's what God was thinking. Okay, well, you don't want him. I'll take him. And literally, they, they rushed him away. And they rushed him away because there were issues. They put him in intensive care for the first night or so. And, and at that time, you didn't even get to go into the intensive care. We're, we were two thick windows and a hallway away looking through these, this thick glass trying to see our baby connect to all kinds of different equipment. Circumstances can cause separation, can't they? And now, fortunately, the, Tim was fine. They got him out then, um, cleared out the lungs and all the other issues he had, and never had any problems with his heart. Have you ever noticed how um, jobs can be a, a point of separation? We're in a day uh, as where too many people, their job has become their, their idol. And the job is almost more important than the family and their relationship with God. Jobs can, can sep- cause separation. One of the sad ones is how, how divorce is causing the pain of separation. Couples will separate couples will get divorced and and as much as we say we're going to go through this nicely right Um, and and we're going to be kind we're not going to hurt each other everyone gets hurt everyone does Um, divorce and of course death causes the pain of separation doesn't it when you say goodbye to somebody you love if if (laughs) how can we not Think about last week, right? Look, to be sitting there like Jason was to look at his, his, uh, his son's body across the other side of the pool and to see that he, he said he was dead. Death, death is painful. And the sad thing is, death is painful for everybody, isn't it? Even if you love somebody and you know that they're gonna be in heaven, I remember the night that we said goodbye to Jeff, Leslie's husband. And, and I mean, it's Christmas time. And, and, and we knew he was going to Jesus. He was kind of like, you know, rushing to get out of here because <laughs> he wanted to, to be with the Lord. But it still is painful. It's, you still, you love somebody, you miss them. The day that I got the call about Mike Brocker, and, and Connie's on the other side of the phone, and and he's just died. And how do you how do you prepare for a moment like that? And sure, he can be with Jesus, but but it hurts. Death is painful for us, and life in so many different ways. When we're separated from somebody, uh, somebody that we really care about, uh, there's pain involved there. Paul says, you know, it hurt to be pulled away from you. And, and I just remind you that Paul was <laughs> literally torn out of the town. The people, want, they'd only been there for three weeks. They'd been preaching to them about Jesus and the resurrection. And several people are accepting Christ. And the, the town folks, get, the, the Jews who are jealous of Paul's crowds that are occurring, come and they want him arrested. They, they want him beat up. They actually beat some of the brand new Christians. Christians who had just become Christians in just two weeks. They beat them up. They're arresting them. And so the Christians who have become Christians just two weeks say, Paul, we got to get you out of town. And they grab him and run him out of town. The, the Christians take him out of town in order to rescue him. He will head on, eventually get to Corinth. And there is where he's writing the bo- letter to the Thessalonians saying, I love you guys. I mean, just a, such a short time. You meant so much to me. And I'm really concerned do you still know Jesus? I mean, have you lost it? Or where are you? And he's that broken because he's been, as he says, been ripped away from them. He said, we've made every effort to, to try to see you. We, we tried to see you face to face. Uh, and you have to know that, to see, 
back in that day, they didn't have Skype, FaceTime, you know, your, your, your t phone that you could do a video call, conference call. We get to do that now with, uh, with our grandchildren back in Florida. Um, we can see them on, on, our, on our phones, actually. We actually simply do a video call. Um, Theo loves to take the phone, and he'll turn it upside down and <laughs> mess around with it. But we actually, the other day, he actually called Debbie. The, Theo, he's 22 months old, just under 22 months old. He actually called Debbie. Did he do it intentionally? I don't know. Debbie and I believe so. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but we can do video calls today. This afternoon, we're going to have a board meeting. One of our board members has been in Georgia and the south, the southern part of the states now for a couple, three months. He's going to be there for two or three more months. And so uh, how do we have a board meeting? We're going to put him up on that screen over there. Uh, and, and we'll get to t see him face to face. They didn't have that back then. They didn't even have cell phones, right? They didn't have, have the email ability. They didn't have any of those other kind of electronic things that we have today. They didn't even have telegraph or anything. You know what? That's an old thing they, they used to put over wires, okay? Uh, some of you aren't old enough. Anyways, uh, they didn't have any of the tools that we've had. And in fact, they didn't even get to, uh, in order, if you were going to send a letter, you would do this. You'd say, Tyler, would you please go to Thessalonians? Thessalonica for me. Okay, well, okay, it's going to take me four months, Paul. All right, I'll head over there. And, 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 and that's what Paul did with Timothy. He sent Timothy, he said, you're my letter. You go check out, see how they're doing. That's going to take four more months then for him to come back and finally update Paul on how they're doing. <clears throat> we made every effort, and it was a big one, in order to try to get face-to-face -face with you. J.I. Packer, um, who's a great um, theologian and has th done some really good things on our personal time with God, um, talks about six marks of maturity that he got from a psychologist. He says, Americans love to take self-examinations. So here's one for you on what it means to be grown up, to be whole, balanced, sane, and able to cope with life. In other words, how do you handle the pain and the hurt and the heartaches of life? And Packer says, here from a psychologist, there are six things you can do. Christian, by the way, here says, the first, the first mark of maturity is the ability to deal constructively with reality, to face facts, to not cover up reality or call it something else, but to deal with it as it is. M mature people do not kid themselves. What did he say? I'm an atheist. You had to deal with the fact I'm addicted. I've got these uh, uh, alcohol and stuff. I've got these other stuff I'm doing. I'm messed up. Okay, mature people don't kid themselves about themselves. Number two. The second mark is adapting quickly to change. We all experience change, right? <laughs> Whether it be physical, at work, in the family, whatever, I'm amazed at how much some of you have changed through the years while I remain exactly the same. Immature people resist change. It makes them nervous. But the mark of maturity is to adapt to change because change is inevitable. We have to adjust. We may not like it. We may not enjoy it sometimes. But we're all needing to adjust to change. Paul's dealing with that. The third mark is freedom from the symptoms of tension and anxiety. The worried look, the frown, the ulcers, the palpitations of the heart all come because you are upset, anxious, and worried. Maturing means you have begun to see that God is in control of this world. He is working out purposes that you do not always understand, but you accept it. He will take you through the deep water, not drown you in it. Maturity means you are learning to trust God. Fourth, it means to be satisfied more with giving than receiving. <clears throat> to see the joy in someone else's face when they get something they either need or want. That is a sign you are growing up. You are discovering the true values of life, that it truly is a more enjoyable thing to be able to give to other people rather than to take. The fifth mark of maturity is to relate to others with consistency, helpfulness, and mutual satisfaction. 
Maturity is learning to get along with other people, to be a help, not a hindrance, to contribute to the solution and not to always be a part of the problem. You're looking at even the person who maybe you didn't like that well, you're starting to learn to love them. That takes maturity. And then finally, maturity is sublimating and redirecting anger to constructive ends. Wow, say this to all of America right now. Maturity is the ability to use the adrenaline that anger creates, not to lose your temper and add to the problem, but to correct a situation or to contribute to changing the nature of the difficulty. That is maturing, and that is what the apostle longed for in these believers in Thessalonica. Paul wanted to go back and check the Thessalonians, see how they were doing. He wanted to get face to face with them because he was concerned. Are you growing or not? Okay, in just three weeks, you said, I believe in Jesus. Now what? Talk about never having a discipleship program, okay? <laughs> These guys had just three weeks. How many sermons did you hear when you were growing up? See, Jesus did all kinds of things. And these had three weeks, at best three weeks, Three Sabbaths, that is. And in fact, they probably weren't at all three Sabbaths. And, and then Paul's going. And Silas. And Timothy. And now they're on their own. And they've got the responsibility to stand up against the horrible persecution they're facing. They're literally going to be beat and abused and imprisoned and all kinds of bad stuff happening to them. Just brand new baby, baby, really whining. No, excuse me, not whining. Crying babies. <laughs> And then Paul goes on, and he says, we wanted to come to you so bad, but we were blocked by Satan. We were hindered by Satan from coming to you. Whoa. May I just say, by the way, some of us use the word, you know, oh, Satan tempted me. I'm sorry. Mm, I really apologize. You're not that important for Satan to tempt you. I, you're just not, okay? Satan is not omnipresent. He's not everywhere, okay? Satan is not all-knowing. He doesn't know everything about you, okay? Because Satan is not equal with God. Now, maybe if you're using the word Satan tempted me and you're using that as in something evil, maybe even my own thoughts tempted me, okay, but the fact is, is that Satan himself doesn't deal with most of us. Now, it could be one of his minions, one of the small de uh, demons or something like that. But for most of us, we're never, thank God, going to ever be facing off with Satan himself. However, Paul's kind of significant, isn't he? Just a little bit important. He's got the major responsibility for taking the good news of Jesus Christ to the Gentile world, which, by the way, includes most of us unless you're a Jew. Okay. We get to hear about Jesus and what he did for us because Paul started this great mission to reach out to the Gentiles. I guess one of the reasons why I'm saying this is sometimes we're giving Satan way too much credit, a lot more than he deserves. He is not equal with God. He doesn't have the power, the knowledge, the spiritual ability that God has. But he does try, and his minions try to hinder the work of God, don't they? And sadly, sometimes we do. See, so we're, we're fighting evil. Yes, in fact, what will Paul do when, in, when he's dealing with the Ephesian church? He's going to say to the Ephesian church, hey guys, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand and keep on standing. Therefore, stand firm with all of the armor, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, the, the, your, your belt of truth, uh, their, your feet shod with the gospel of peace. And by the way, and, he, and here's the most important one, with that sword he is now and pray. And, and that's the way I'm going to be bold. And that's the way we're going to stand firm is because you've got to pray. And those are all kinds of tools that he's given to us us, that we're, we are in a spiritual battle, and we need to be more aware of that battle so that we can resist and, and, have, and be victorious, stand firm as Ephesians 6 says. Father God, um, right now there's a crisis. 
somebody's in need. We don't know what's going on, but you do. And Lord Jesus, I just pray you for your peace to be present. I pray for somebody to be there to show the love of Jesus Christ. Pray, Lord, for you to get the, those you know, heading to the emergency, to get them there safely and help them to meet the needs according to your riches in Christ's name. Amen. We were being, Paul says, we were being hindered, held back, totally blocked by Satan. God, even though evil will try to hinder what God wants done, God is going to use everything to accomplish his purposes. Uh, by the way, yesterday we were uh, downtown picking up some things for the coffee shop, and we came up to Orange Show Road, the uh, off-ramp just north of the Interstate 10, and, and as we drove up north, we were coming up from Moreno Valley. So we, we get up there, and all of a sudden, there's a whole bunch of traffic on the off-ramp at Orange Show Road. So I get over, clear over to the right because I wanted to go over to E Street. We were, by the way, getting bread for the coffee shop. And oh my goodness, you got to come try our bread. It's really delicious. Oh yeah, yeah, it's really, it's really delicious. Um, we're going to have sandwiches. Forget the meat, it's the bread. <laughs> okay. Uh, anyways, that's an aside. But so we're, we're coming up there, and, and, we, and we, we get to, we're, and, and the off-ramp is packed. And if you know the Orange Show Road off-ramp, there's like four lanes there. It's just packed. And we finally get by the cars, get off to the right. I'm like, what is going on? Is there, and there was a sign near the off-ramp that said something about $88 car you know, down payment today. You could buy a car for just $88. Oh, okay. There must be a lot of people going to go buy a car for $88. So, so, well, later, we got back on the 10 again and then t tried to take the 10 around the 215, and all of a sudden, it, the t traffic was stopped up totally again. What's going on? Well, as you get closer, then we realized why all this had happened. The, the, the off-ramp from the 10 heading west to the 215 south was closed shut down and everyone on that freeway who wanted to go south was being hindered by whatever was going on on that off-ramp probably some construction or something like that but they were being hindered they were being stopped that's by the way the word that's being used here in the text satan was hindering was an obstruction was keeping paul and his friends from getting back to thessalonica to disciple and equip and build up the christians there <clears throat> My question is, can you discern when Satan is hindering you, when evil is hindering you, when a minion of, God, of evil is trying to stop you from doing something? Can you discern that? Or do you simply say, every time you don't get your way, that was evil? <laughs> every time something didn't just go the way you wanted it to? That must have been evil because you're in such a battle with evil all the time. You know, can you discern the difference? Because I need to warn you that Paul had another experience as well. In fact, as he was going through Asia, preaching the gospel, telling them about Jesus Christ, it says that he's trying to go over and and. and Literally, the Holy Spirit stops him. Acts 16 says it this way. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the, listen to this, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. I thought Paul was supposed to go out and preach the word. Wasn't that his job? What's the Holy Spirit thinking of stopping Paul from preaching the word in Asia? I mean, that's what he was called to do, preach the word, right? And, and the Holy Spirit, get this, it's not just the Holy Spirit, there's more. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. Guys, hello, God, you've sent me to preach the gospel, but you're not going to let me preach in Asia, you're not going to let me preach in Bithynia? What is this? But see, here's the thing, Paul recognized the difference between God's voice and Satan. He could discern when God was saying, I don't want you to go here. And, and if you remember the rest of the story, he's, he's sleeping that night. God gives him a vision, and, and the vision is of a man over across the waters in Macedonia. And, and he wakes up the next morning and says, pack it up, guys. I know where we're heading. We're going, getting on a ship, and we're heading over to Macedonia because God has called us there. 
And look, God uses hindrances, obstructions, the things that try to stop us. Even when evil tries to do it, God uses those things to accomplish God's purposes. The Holy Spirit had stopped them. Jesus had said, no, don't go in here because they wanted Paul to head to Macedonia. Do you discern and can you discern when it's, the, when it's evil and when it's Jesus that's trying to guide you? you see, God may actually be trying to stop you from doing something and you're just thinking, oh, somebody wasn't me, doesn't want me to have fun or it's just uh, the evil's in my way and yet God's the one trying to protect you. So Paul says, we were hindered by Satan. But finally, finally, I got to tell you, I've learned something special. Do you know what motivates Paul? It's in the text. He's, he says, this, he talks about his hope, his joy, his crown. And really, that's a question I want to ask you is, what is your hope, your joy, your crown? What is it you're looking forward to? Getting a bigger job? Um, what do they say? That the number one retirement plan for people in the United States, do you know what it is? The number one retirement plan for people in the United States by far above any others is I'm going to win the lottery. Good luck. <laughs> number one. <laughs> I don't know how many people are not going to have a retirement plan based on that one. What, what is it that keeps Paul going when he's facing personally such severe uh, opposition? Corinth is just as, almost as bad as Thessalonica. Athens is the same thing. Eventually, he's going to make it all the way to Rome. He's going to be beheaded. He's going to die for Jesus. Uh, there's all kinds of opposition. What is it that keeps him going? Well, here's what I think it is. It's the hope that he has in Jesus Christ. And, and notice, he says, here's my hope, my joy, my crown. What is hope? Well, the, the world's definition kind of goes more like this. I hope so. I, I hope something is going to happen. That's not biblical hope. That's not God's hope. That's not what kept Paul going. Uh, for Paul, hope was defined as a desire for some future good. And the expectation, even the belief, that it would definitely happen. That was hope for Paul. Hope said, something's happening in the future. I know it's going to happen. I trust God to make it happen. And that's what gives me hope. Hope is confident expectancy. Hope's looking forward to something with some reason for confidence and respecting fulfillment. <clears throat> the world typically defines hope as a desire for some future occurrence of which one is not assured of attaining. In fact, in the ancient world, you know how they saw hope? He's hoping to eat. That's all it is, right? <laughs> the, the, way, the way hope, hope is it, the way the world saw it. In the ancient world, historians tell us that a great crowd of hopelessness covered the ancient world. Plato speaks of living in evil hope, in the apprehension of evil and Thucydides of the hope of evils to come, the expectation of apprehension. In the ancient world, they believed everything was going to go bad. That was their hope. Seneca even put it this way, Rome's leading intellectual figure. He was the tutor of Emperor Nero. Nasty, nasty guy. Killed thousands upon thousands of his own, supposedly probably as the one who actually burned down Rome and blamed it on the Christians, and so they get killed. <laughs> well, guess what? Seneca, who was, by the way, forced to commit suicide by Nero, he, he, he defined hope as an uncertain good. An uncertain good. By the way, that's the antithesis of biblical hope. When you know Jesus Christ, you have a certain hope for the future. Paul's always looking forward to something really important, and that is the return of Jesus Christ. He is looking ahead to Jesus Christ coming back. For what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? When Jesus comes, that's the parousia. 
the return of Jesus Christ. Matthew, Jesus said it this way, Matthew 24, as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? Okay, Jesus, you've been talking about, you're coming again, your parousia. Tell us about it. When's it gonna happen? Give us the details. Verse 12, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. And that's the only description that Jesus gives to spell it out. And Paul talks some more in, in 2 Corinthians 5 when he says this. We know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan. Anybody in pain today? few of you? <laughs> You're groaning, aren't you? We groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened, because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. We're groaning here because we want to have a body that's not going to be in pain. We, we groan here because we want to have a body that's going to be full of joy. We want to be alive, and here we're dying. From the day we were born, we were dying. Amen? And, but when we get there, from the day we get to heaven, we're living forever. And so there's a part of us that, you know, oh, I'm so tired of whatever. That's the groaning that our bodies are going through. Now, the one who has fashioned us, verse 5, for this very purpose is God who has given us the spirit as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. We're all going to come to a day when we're going to stand in front of the throne of Jesus Christ. What does Paul say? You're my glory. Have you thought about what it'll be like when you get to heaven? Are you really looking for getting to heaven and finally having this big golden crown with tons of jewels in it? If you were watching the most recent um, wedding, the British wedding, right? They were actually talking about the kind of uh, Ciara, what she was going to be wearing, what it was going to do to her, and who she had, and all, and that she didn't have her own family, and all those other kinds of issues, and all. And then they talked about how really uncomfortable those things are. <laughs> really? Dude, you really want to go around? I just can't wait to get to heaven to wear that big golden crown, yeah. <laughs> a bunch of jewels, which are now going to be meaningless because everybody else has got a golden crown on too, so it's you know, no more valuable. Okay? In fact, did you, you heard about the guy that um, was saving up for heaven, cashed in all of his wealth, turned it all into gold, took it with him to heaven. When he got to heaven, he gets there to, to, to meet Peter, and Peter's meeting him at the gate. He says, welcome, you know, okay, well, here, you're, you're, you're welcome to come in. Um, I, but he says, um, I'm not sure you, what you're going to do with all that pavement you brought with you. <laughs> Yeah, some of you are getting it. <laughs> Paul says, you're our glory. You're what we're going to celebrate. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 11 says, since then we know that is what it is like to fear the Lord, we try to persuade others. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to your conscience. Verse 14, for Christ's love compels us. God's at work in our life. He says, Christ's touching me. It's Christ's love that's affecting me. It's Christ's love that's going to influence Tyler as he's working with the youth. Christ's love is compelling me, he says, because we're convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, and the new has come, the old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled to us to himself through Christ and did what? Gave us the ministry of reconciliation. We have a responsibility to take care of other people, to help them come to know the love of Jesus Christ. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. And I love this. 
as though God were making his appeal through us. Have you been making God's appeal lately? We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. A wealthy man had three friends, a rabbi, a Catholic priest, and a Baptist pastor. Isn't that that joke? You know, and, and if you saw the one this week that went out and they, they hit a bar and like they hit, you know, literally they all ran into a bar. And, and that's not, anyways, so the man wanted to, to, to take his wealth with him. He wanted to make sure that he got his wealth with him into heaven. So he literally gave thousands of dollars, biggest currency you could find, to these three friends of his. He didn't trust anyone else with the cash. So he gives the cash, you know, thousands upon thousands of dollars, gives it to his rabbi friend, his Catholic priest friend, and his Baptist minister friend. So they're standing there the day of the funeral. And, and they were, their responsibility was, he said, look, when, you, when you're there in front of the um, casket, I just want you to put my money in to make sure that it gets there. Because, you know, you know, I mean, you know what the grave diggers are going to do. You know what the guys, you know, the mortician, I don't know. And so I want you to stick it in the casket just before they lower me, okay? So the three guys put their envelopes in. Later, they're talking, and um, finally the rabbi says, you know, guys, I, I, I'm really sorry. It just, it just, this is really bothering me, you know. I got a Jewish mom, and so I've got guilt all, all over me. And, and I just got to admit, we've been doing a, a, a um, building program at the church, at the, at the synagogue, and um, I didn't have enough money, so I took 10% out of the envelope, kept it to use for the building program. <laughs> got the Catholic priest and the Baptist pastor, like, oh my, I can't believe that you did that. And finally, then the Catholic priest says, you know, I, I just got to tell you, we've been having our own challenges whole steeple's all damaged and all. The organ's not working. I took 20% out. Oh, man, I can't believe it. There Now that the, the Baptist pastor's just incredulous. I cannot believe that you guys both did this. We all committed to doing it. I just want you to know, I wrote a check for that cash and put that check in the envelope. <laughs> True story now. True story. This is not a joke. True story. Her name is Sandra West. She died March 10th, 1977. She uh, lived out here in Beverly Hills, uh, was buried back in, t in Texas, by the way, San Antonio. Okay. You can actually go. In fact, people still go to this cemetery just to see this lady's grave because she was buried in her 1964 powder blue Ferrari 250 GT. Quote, with the seat slanted comfortably. <laughs> she was buried in a white type, almost wedding type gown, very fancy gown, with the seat tilted comfortably. Do you get it? <laughs> and they put, they put the Ferrari inside this big 10 by 19 by whatever it was, 9 foot uh, concrete vault, and then just to make sure that nobody would get in and take away or do something to that, they put a concrete top on it as well. And you can still go to the cemetery in Texas and find the grave site, all the grass, underneath which, nine foot down, is this vault holding Sandra West and her 1964 powder blue Ferrari 250 GT. I'm sorry, you can try, but you can't take it with you. <laughs> Matthew 6, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What riches can you take with you to heaven? You can't take gold, besides it's pavement anyways. You can't take your Ferrari, won't work there, okay? You, you can't take the things of this life with you. You were born in this life with nothing. You go out of this life with nothing. But there is one th treasure. It's an incredible treasure. It's the best treasure of all. There is one thing that you can take with you to heaven, and that is the person you loved 
into a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the person, your neighbor, who you spoke to and befriended, and they made a commitment to Jesus Christ. That's the youth that you work with who then make a decision to follow Jesus Christ. That's your coworker. That's your family member. That's, that's the person who was dying that you loved to Jesus. There are, there's one thing you can take to heaven and nothing else, and it's the people that came to know Jesus. <clears throat> it's a song that's um, moved Debbie and I over the years. Um, I dreamed I went to heaven. You were there with me. We walked upon the streets of gold beside the crystal sea. We heard the angels singing and someone called your name. You turned and saw this young man. He was smiling as he came. And he said, friend, you may not know me now. Then he said, but wait, you used to teach my Sunday school when I was only eight. And every week you would say a prayer before the class would start. And one day when you said that prayer, I asked Jesus in my heart, thank you for giving to the Lord. I am a life that was changed. Thank you for giving to the Lord. I am so glad you gave. Well, the story goes on. Says, then another man stood before you. He said, remember the time a missionary came to your church? His pictures made you cry. You didn't have much money, but you gave it anyway. Jesus took the gift you gave. That's why I'm here today. One by one they came, far as the eye could see, each life somehow touched by your generosity. Little things that you had done, sacrifices made, unnoticed on the earth, in heaven, now proclaimed. I know up in heaven, you're not supposed to cry, but I'm almost sure there were tears in your eyes. As Jesus took your hand, you stood before the Lord. He said, my child, look around you. Great is your reward. Thank you for giving to the Lord. I am a life that was changed. Thank you for giving to the Lord. I am so glad you gave. I am so glad you gave. God wants you to get a beautiful crown when you get to heaven. And in it are the jewels. And the jewels are not gold, or excuse me, not amethyst, diamonds, or anything else, emerald, whatever. The jewels are the people who will be there because you loved them and shared Jesus with them. What will you celebrate when you get to heaven? It would be crushing to get to heaven and to see that a whole host of people that you knew that you loved didn't make it. Because you didn't share. What will you celebrate? God, I pray that if there's anybody here today who hasn't said yes to you, that they'll at least say, okay, God, even if I don't, not totally convinced, I'm going to give you an opportunity to show yourself to me, to help me to know whether you really exist or not. I pray that, that there'd be no one that would leave this room here without at least taking that step. And then, Lord, if there's someone here who says, okay, I'm ready. I, I, I believe Jesus is real. I believe he loves me. If he can do what he did for Tyler, for me, then I want Jesus in my life. And I, I just to say... It's so simple that it's probably going to bug you. All you have to do is say yes to Jesus. Just say yes. No, please don't wait to get perfect because you'll never get there. Not, to, not in this life. 
Please don't try to clean everything up so that then you can come to Jesus. No, just today, say yes. And if you say yes to Jesus today, please tell someone else. Somebody else here? Tell them, I said yes to Jesus. But there's another yes I want to challenge us all to. What are you going to celebrate when you get to heaven? There is no greater celebration than to have somebody walk up to you and say thank you. <coughs> thank you for sharing Jesus with me. Folks, will you make a commitment today to get ready for that celebration by sharing Jesus wherever you're at? Father, thank you for what you've done for us. Thank you for the, the people. And I know for me it's been more than one person. For John Haggai in the sermon that he preached there at Chafee High School, <laughs> public high school, there you invited me to become your child to accept your love. For my parents who, in, in, even with all their anger and meanness and all the garbage, Lord, um, still got me to church. For men who were there who showed me that you cared. And for people all along the journey, in numerous congregations and across here in Southern California and Arizona where you've allowed us to serve for so many, Jesus, who believed in you and helped to firm my faith in you. Thank you. Oh, Jesus, help us to be someone who gives you to others. In Jesus' name.